Hey everybody, welcome to Shit I Love with Jason Stewart and my guest Ida Rodriguez, actress, comedian, writer, producer, internet sensation, <laughs> uh, the gal that knows everything about everybody and everything that's going on in town who I ask all the time. She's, just, she's got her ear to the ground and you just seem to really be in the know. You really are on the cutting edge of what's going on in terms of social media and pol politics and all sorts of stuff. And I absolutely love you. I love you too. So I'm so glad you're on the show. Me too. And I love this image. I love this new image for this show. Oh, do you? Yeah. And I can't believe you use the word shit because you're so popular. I know. <laughs> yes. Because that, well, it's because of you. Oh, good. I'm glad. Because I wanted to do, I wanted to see, you know, I guess I'm embarrassed now. I wanted to be cutting edge, you know, and be hip and cool and not be some old guy that doesn't want to move to the next level. You're I don't cool. want to be one of those people that say, no, I won't do that. Well, you're cool anyway, and when you when you get on stage and you tell your jokes, you're cutting edge sometimes, and it's funny, and you do it with a smile, and people enjoy it. Well, welcome to my very first show. Oh, this is the first yeah, one. Yeah, this is the first one. Nice. And uh, let's talk about the first time we met. Okay. We were at the Improv. Yes. I was doing a show. We were both on the same bill, I believe, mm -hmm. and you said to me, do you remember? You said, I am going to be friends with you. Yeah. That's it. I had like, I had no choice. I was taken captive. Yeah, that's me. I either like people or... <laughs> you don't. <laughs> yeah, not that I don't, but I like, I just, I haven't this instant love at first sight thing with my friends. All of my friends who have been my friends for many years, every single one of them, it was something that I saw and I said, I want to be that person's friend. And I've never been embarrassed nor ashamed to say to someone, I want to be your friend, even when I was little. I said it and they said, next. <laughs> Not me. No, no, you were. You were definitely stepped up to the plate. So I want to know, I don't know, we were talking when you first came here, because we do this at my house, mm -hmm. and uh, we're in my home office, which is too many pictures of me on the walls. They're everywhere, I love it. But only in this room, and my therapist, I had a therapist uh, around 15 years ago tell me, you must put this stuff up, so when I feel like my life is over, I look and I go, oh, hey, I actually, you know. Oh, she told you to put it up. Yes, I it's actually great. accomplished something. Um, so when you walked in the house today, we were talking about acting, and I didn't know that you were a performing arts kid yeah, when you were a kid. Yeah, no, in between the beatings and the, uh, and the wick cheese and food stamps, I was fascinated by theater. And so I was one of those kids that I didn't go to a school that had a performing arts program, um, but I had a very good teacher that allowed us to say do the teacher's name. Miss Sylvia Rowe, one of the great, she was one of the loves of my life. And she was my fifth grade teacher. And she would put productions on herself. She was like, we're going to do it. What did you so, do? What productions? Um, I, we did, when I was little, we did Fame. I was Coco. Really? Yeah, of course. Because the, the actual Fame, before the Broadway show Fame or yeah, the movie we did, Fame? We do, no, I wasn't allowed to see the movie. It was uh, too much for me at that time. <laughs> but the play, and it was funny because I remember... Um, my daughter performed at the Imagen Awards last year, and she sang On My Own. I did not know that. Yeah, she sang Out Here. I went with you the year before. Well, last year she sang Out Here On My Own, and I sang that in the sixth grade for um, the when we did our version of Fame. Can you sing a couple? Or can you um, Sometimes I wonder. Sometimes I wonder where I've been. Yeah, I love that song. Who I am. Do I fit in? But my favorite song was The Body Electric. Oh, not mine. Mine was Dogs in the Yard. Oh, Dogs in the Yard. The little gay kid great. sitting in his house singing, I Just Want to Be Dogs in the Yard. Oh, that song just killed me. And when yeah. I saw that movie, it just sent me to another place. I actually tried to get in on that movie. It was called Did Lunchtime you? at the time. Yes. And I actually stood in line for hours to get in for them to look and just meet me for two seconds. It was just a very big deal. To be able, to, it was Alan Parker, who was a brilliant, brilliant director, who uh, I always wanted to work with, and now he's a British director. He directed, you know, some just really, really great films, The Commitments, which I loved, Angel Heart with De Niro and Lisa Bonet. Oh yeah, that was also pretty you know, risque film. Oh, at the time. Yeah. So, what other parts did you play in the theater? I did. Uh, I was Evita. That, Don't I, cry. That's why when... Because, you know, I'm not saying it, but you're not a singer by... 
no, you know, but studied I was, a, I was a performing arts. Not but that's an operetta. No, I know. I took vocal lessons, though. I did take vocal lessons. I took vocal lessons not that long ago. It's just something I do secretly. I also recorded a song with Neo, the superstar singer, chart topper. I, we did a reggaeton song together that he wrote for me. And When you were a kid? No, that was not. No, that was like maybe uh, probably before stand-up, maybe about 10 years ago. Wow. But I'm not a singer. I mean... But Evita is an operetta. Oh, no, I know. I just can't... Then the other day, when, did you watch the Grammys? Did you see No, I Patty didn't. The phone? No, I'm going to watch all the uh, oh. YouTube clips. There's too much rap. And I like rap, but I can't watch that much rap. Well, I mean, it wasn't... It was very poppy this year. Oh, was it? And the clothes rap. always disappoint me when someone shows up in ripped t-shirt. You oh, know, well, and, and, pink wore jeans and a white tee. She was very casual. But it was very... Um, the, you know, people were protesting about who won, but I thought... Because I there it, was no women, right? Well, I think the, that was the more important. One woman won. And it was just very... Um, For those at home who don't know, they switched the categories. There's no more best woman and best man singer, male, female, right? It's just best singer in that category. Am I, I correct? I don't know. No, no, no. Yeah, a lot is of the a lot of the character car categories are like that. Oh. So you and I could be up for best pop singer. <laughs> well, that that explains a lot because mm -hmm. Bruno Mars beat everyone. Yeah. Uh, people were upset because Kendrick Lamar didn't win album of the year. He won best rap album of the year, but they felt like the the Academy will. The, yeah, they won't allow a rap album to be the best album. Didn't, the that's year. not true because Eminem's album was one. Yeah, year. Eminem is white. So, but there is a rap. He is. He was at that time the biggest rap star of. He's the a great one of the and greatest think, rappers ever. You know, and Prince is one album of the year, I think, and he had a lot of rap. He rapped but it before. Was, rap. It's not considered a hip hop album. No, no. But Kendrick Lamar's album was very. Um, it was great. It was very um, timely. It was talking about all the stuff that is going on in the world, and it was really, really beloved by everyone, not just the hip hop community. Mainstream people loved it. Radio I've not heard it, but so I'm, I'm not terrible. It's just so funny because I met with Mark Brazil, the guy who created that 70s show. I know Mark, and he was quoting, um, "Sit down, be humble." He was like, "I love this song." Like uh -huh. he's a middle aged white guy. You know? Oh yeah, but a hip cool dude. Yeah, he's super cool. But you know, he liked the song because of the content, and so there was a lot of controversy, and it was just so much. I guess now because of the internet. Nobody's ever going to be happy, so there will always be outrage. It, that's just or everybody has an opinion about yeah. everything, and so that's just our reality now. There will always be a group of people who have to protest something. That's just it's like the '60s all over again, but with tech, more technology, with more eyes on everything, more mm -hmm. eyeballs, more communication. So, how did you start doing stand up? Because you were a model before, am I correct? I was a failed model. I'm sorry. You just dropped her pen. I did. I dropped my pen. It makes me nervous when I talk about modeling because it was like a dark uh, period in my life. Because you were so hungry. And it was, I was starving. And it was something that, you know, was fun because I never thought I could do that. I never set out to model. Someone How did was, it happen? I was at uh, the mall with my grandmother and my mother and a, a scout was like, that girl is a model. She has an amazing look. She's exotic. And I was just... I, was like, I hate that term exotic, I got to tell you. Of course. Because that means not white. Of course. And I don't like that. Of course. And the thing that was weird was that I, you know, I was super tall. I had a complex. I was hunched over. How tall were you? 5'10". Five, five, oh, you I, still are. I, yeah. I never, I grew <laughs> this much. And so I was this tall in high school. So I'm 14, tall, awkward, feeling Oh, you were 14. Yes. And then, um, you know, at school, people would make fun of me because I was so skinny. They used to call me olive oil. And God, you just wish you could be that skinny easily yeah, again. Yeah, now right? it's like back then I hated it. And now I'm like, right. I'm like, like call me toothpick. Yeah. I don't give a shit. As much as I starve myself. But it was funny because this lady was like, she's amazing. She has it. And then um, I told my grandmother, because that's who I am. I said, well, I don't want to go step out into the modeling world if I don't have training. So you got to send me to Barbizon. <laughs> Right, because that's what everybody knew and, when they'd walk around with the books on their head, yeah, right? But it was so good for me because it's, Barbizon is like a, a glorified charm school. So in addition to teaching you um, some stuff about modeling, the walking with the book on your head really helps you with your posture. Especially for a kid who's trying to not be tall. Yeah, so look for stuff. And they also taught you etiquette. Like there were what fork was for the salad, like all that kind of stuff, which is stuff that I didn't get where I was coming from. Even though my grandmother was a creature of decorum, I, I was living with my mom, and my mom 
did, didn't care about the difference between a dinner fork and a salad fork. So Barbizon was cool for me. But then um, I did a modeling competition a little a few years after, and I won everything. I won every... What did you have to do to win? It was a runway competition. There was a commercial competition. There was a print a photo competition and um and Naomi Campbell's agent no my Tyra Banks's agent uh, came for me and she was they flew me to New York with IMG and wow, then Wow that's heady for a fourteen year old kid. No that was I was older. I was like seventeen. Seventeen? It's still heady. Yeah it was. It was a and you were living in Miami at the time? No, I was living in um I was, yeah I was living in Florida and uh, you know it was just weird because I never thought I could do that. And then I had these people telling me. See, that. I always thought that I could, but no one chose me. It's just the opposite of you. It's so I weird. thought that I was a model. I thought that I had but the. But you look like it. No, you. I know. I, I have all the looks, but I don't have the body. Or the, it's in my. It's stuck in my own head. Oh, you're right. No, it, it's all about who you, who, you know, look at you. You could have been a model. But the thing is, you know, then I have, I go from one extreme to the other. So now I have this woman named Monique who's. Paris Models USA, and she wants me to move to Milan. And she's like, we're going to get you a model apartment. And um, and my boyfriend at the time told me that if I went to model overseas, that he was going to break up with me, and I didn't go. Ah! <laughs> and my mom didn't support me. So I was really just like, I should have gone. I wish I would have been. And you, of course, whatever happened to him. Brave. Right, well, we broke up. But... <laughs> You know, I really wish that I would have, I, I really wish I would have gone. And um, I don't live in regret, but I do think. Oh, I do. But I, I think it's say. important to tell people <laughs> some of the things you, you know, that it's it's okay. Because people say there you shouldn't be regretful. But I think it should, you should be honest about how Yeah, I mean, there are things that you wish you didn't do. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I can't say that I, I, I hold it in my heart. But I just say, oh, God, I wish I hadn't turned down that street and made that choice. Maybe something would have happened different. But it's just the way it is, and you have to accept it and then move on. And what? so then where did you go after that in your career? You got married and had two kids. Oh, yeah, no. You I, were 19, I, I already right? had the kid, actually. So when I got married... How old were you when you had your first kid? Well, I won't discuss that. Oh. I will not. Oh, you, you, the age is gone. So, we, we, so yeah. you had, we, 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 the boyfriend I was bet, not your ex-husband. Yeah, he was. He oh, was my was. first boyfriend. So you had two kids with him and then... Yeah, he was my first boyfriend. I got married to him after I had my first child. Oh, and then we had our second child. And then you got married. So you were married with the second child. Yeah, I got married. But you were together. We were together. You were a couple, yeah. yeah. But, um, it but that's was, the way straight people do it now. Well, I didn't know that that's how we were doing it. I was that's just, what I read. You, you know. know, when I got pregnant, my mom was, my dad, my stepfather at the time was like, he's going to marry you or I'm going to kill him. Uh -huh. um, you know, he took your virginity and all this stuff. So anyway, you know, I left. You loved him probably at the yeah. time. And I still was, I was still modeling, um, just not at the level that I could have been. I went to, I was still doing runway shows and I was doing really well. And then I went to New York and I went to New York and... I was like, I'm just going to go try it out. And the first Wait, day... Did you bring your kids? I took my son with me. I didn't ah. have my daughter at the time. But I went to New York. That's that's really ballsy. Yeah, it was really funny taking a baby to a go see with you. But you know what? The very first day that I went to New York, I got there. I landed a magazine cover and a music video, which I didn't do, and a photo shoot that was a paid photo shoot. And I was like, maybe I can do this. <laughs> yes. I made like all, you know all this money in one day, and then he got drafted by the NFL, and I went I went with him because he was like, you're never gonna make as much money as I am, and I just was so. Um, it's so weird that you can't do both. You know why can't you, people? You see movies about that and stuff yeah. about that. But why, you know, I guess it's just, it's, it's, does that happen now, do you think? Do you think your daughter would put up with that? No. 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 Not she's in a not, way. She's a, she's a feminist. But you know, my daughter was raised by a woman who told her that she had, she can be her own millionaire. She doesn't have to marry one. I was raised, told that the only shot I had at being a millionaire was marrying the right guy. So that. How did you change that paradigm? Because you were only with your ex-husband for a short time, really. Well, yeah, I moved away. That was the first thing I had to do, which was the hardest thing I ever did, was move to California. I had to get away from the environment because it was everywhere. And, you know, my sister, who did it the right way, 
is married with a baby. She lives with her husband in a house. That in that have. order. Yeah, yeah, in that order. And also, you know, that our aspirations are different. Like, I, I, I'm sure you got this too, because it's always the people of our ilk. You're just too ambitious. Like, like you want, like, like... The, I, didn't, I didn't get they were, I was too ambitious. What I got was... You know, it's impossible. Yeah. That you know, was the it. idea of someone, you know, and I don't, that looks like you, that comes from this Jewish family, mm -hmm. that's, you know, working people. My father was the uh, vice president of a necktie manufacturing company. My mother was a beautician. You know, you just didn't do that. It was crazy. And I got to tell you, I believe they were right. Mm -hmm. I believe that they were right. You know, they did it because they loved me. So now, in retrospect, I realized they were trying to protect me. Yeah. But you don't want to crush your kids' dreams. So you try to find a way to uh, do that in a positive way, in the same way that you've done that with your children. Give them a reality check and also let them go for their dreams at the same time. And sort of, you know, I mean, I was crazy. I thought that I was it. You are it. And yeah. I did too. And those are the people that you rattle the cage and you make people around you feel uncomfortable because they don't, they, to, they don't dare... Say that again, because you've said that to me so many times, and I never heard it said so clearly that yeah. I rattle people's cages because I just feel like I'm the one. I've always felt that way. Well, you disturb the comfort zone of people who feel okay being invisible. And you're like, no, I stand out. I am a light. So the people around you who can't, they don't comprehend it because they don't have it or they don't tap into it. I don't think I'm the light or the you know, stand out. I just think that I'm good at what I do. No, and but I, and you, I know have, that. you have a you, thing yeah. because that's what, grabbed, that's what attracted me to you in the first place. I, I watched a, a show of stand-up and um, you were dynamic and it was something about you that I said, oh, oh, he's one of my people. Like I have to be around him because... He stands out. He but this is your interview. So. No, but it's true. And, it, and that's what we, that's mm -hmm. just part of our, the interview is the things that attract you to certain people. Is well, it's like, called Shit I Love and I Love You. Oh, and I Love You Too. So I was like, I want to be around him because he makes people happy with his presence. And uh. a lot of comedians will make you chuckle, make you laugh, they'll make you think, they'll make you mad, but they don't make you happy. Mm. So I like I hear people talking shit about certain comedians, like Darren Carter, the party starter, because of what he does. I love Darren Carter, the party starter. I'll tell you what, after you hear that 50 people got killed in Vegas and all of this stuff is happening mm. in the world, you go to a comedy show and you see Darren Carter, the party starter, and for five to ten minutes, you forget to spend all of that stuff and you just have a good We time. so forget that, don't we? Because I've been in it over 35 years and I yeah. just think, I so forget that we can go. I was telling you before we started that I did a set at the Laugh Factory last Saturday night and the roof just came off. And I think people are so anxiety ridden because of what's going on in the country right now. They want to laugh. I mean, I, I don't even know if they want to laugh. They just want to have a release. Yeah. It's bigger than a laugh. It's like they just want to let go and just not think about everything. And have a good time. And yes. And just, and just let go. And also, they say people don't want to talk about politics. I don't think that's true. I think we want to laugh about the, yeah. the insanity that we live in right now. People don't realize that we're living in a time that's completely... In another space, yeah, and I'm is, and I'm older than you, so I have a different perspective than you probably do because I never thought that we'd step back this many steps. It's really crazy, but and you know what? The other thing we were talking about earlier today, when I was talking to Mark Brazil, I said that everybody has, you know, they've they've they I don't know what the word when they they put the flag in the ground or whatever the the term is. I always mess the terms up in English because I know them in Spanish. But everybody has declared their side. And there was a time... Oh, when they lay the gauntlet down. Yeah, comedians yeah, you used put, to... You, yeah, and there are comedians that are on both sides. That's what People you, are, that you want to hear. That's what Bob Hope used to do. And that's mm -hmm. what... They would make fun of everybody. But the, the thing is that right now, everybody's like, you're on one side or the other. And if you're not... On my side, then I don't want to hear what you have to say. So I think that comedy can be heavy sometimes. Yeah, but at the time, so I disagree with you, because at the time, Bob Hope was a safe comedian. Of course. And in the 60s and 70s, when he was really, his in his real comedian days, and I think he didn't have an opinion. And now people have an opinion. You weren't allowed to have an opinion then. Well, he did have an opinion, because he was a Reagan supporter, but... 
He just never talked about but it. But there wasn't the opinion that we that we have now. But I everybody... mean, the Grammy won for Best Comedy Album was Dave Chappelle. And man, this guy's got an opinion. Yeah, but you know what I think... Um... You can't... You may not uh, uh, agree with his material or not, but you have to admit... You know, I always say... I, Definitely a funny guy. Yeah, no, he's no, funny so, and undeniable. I may not, yeah, undeniable. You know, hysterically funny guy. Same as Jerry Seinfeld, hysterically funny guy. Jerry doesn't have an opinion. Dave has an, a big opinion. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, and you may not dig the material, but you have to say, hey, this person is talented. Well, I mean, I think Dave Chappelle is, is one of the greatest comedians alive. I, I love Dave Chappelle. Well, of the and, time. And I think... Um, equanimity that third special was brilliant you know and i i would never that was the one in the club at the in the belly room at the comedy store no, the one before oh the big one yeah the one where i have to say i thought the one in the belly room was even it was very telling yeah it was and as an as an art form it wasn't finished material he was actually doing a special that was a set which is incredibly um bold bold yeah i mean it was like Streisand going back to the uh, this little club in New York and doing a show in front of 200 people and just singing these jazz songs. Right. And she did that around five years ago. And that was like, is she doing this? Is she standing on a stage that's like, you know, six by six right. inches, yeah. you know, with a three-person band doing this? And he's doing the same thing. And I thought, wow, that took incredible, you know, balls. Well, I mean, I think that it was... Um it was great to see someone who actually went out on a limb be celebrated by the Academy because uh, Dave Chappelle went, came under a lot of fire from the, um, the transgender community about that set and in the first one. I think it was the age of spin. So I thought that, you know, I think that he said he doesn't apologize and he'll never apologize for what he says and he's always getting in trouble for what he says. And I think I, he does it purposely. That's his mm -hmm. thing. But I, I, you know, he's a pot stirrer. He is a pot stirrer. Um, I thought that it was um, also great to see that Sarah Silverman was in the category because there weren't that many women who were even well, not only one. Well, Kathy one. Griffin is now out of the running, and she's the one that's been the most prolific of all the female comedians. I've known Kathy, Kathy a, a long, but long does she time. have an album this year? Uh, not sure. Okay, so because yeah. I know Sarah but, did. Yeah, and. I have to say, you know, Kathy was an interesting comedian because she had her own style. Right. She and Margaret and Janine created this kind of, Janine Garofalo, Margaret mm -hmm. Cho, created this kind of style that didn't really exist. This speaking of your feelings, this, this it, almost storytelling, almost, you know, jazz club kind mm -hmm. of, you know, comedy. And whether you like that comedy or not, or whether you like Dave Chappelle who, you know, story, 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 you know, big joke, story, 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 you know, big joke. Whatever, you, or you like Joe Rivers, da, 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 or da, you know, whatever you like is in style. You cannot say undeniable that they're all talented people. And, you know, I don't know if people, I, I want to say that, see what you think about this. So she gets, and she has a photo shoot with this big famous photographer. Mm -hmm. And as a goof, she holds a, a, a severed head that's bloody that he tells her to do in the shot. Right. She doesn't prepare this, right. go home and do paper mache and create it. He decided this would be an interesting little thing to do. She does the picture, doesn't think of it. He puts it on the internet. Mm -hmm. And she gets so completely blamed. Yeah, she gets and I fired. think she's unraveling a bit because... You know, her whole... And, and anyone would. Well, I heard horrible things happen to her. I, I heard there were threats. There was a gun oh. uh, drawn to her. And, I didn't know about that, but I knew that, that the whole... Uh, uh, the, the president's security was interviewing her for literally months. Yeah, she, she went through a lot behind it. And, you know, I, I think that it's interesting... Someone that has... I'm interrupting you, but someone has no history... Of any violence, right. anywhere, ever, famous, an incredible advocate for women, you know, uh, the underdogs, the LGBT community, and all of a sudden, it was just a real personal attack. Well, I think it was interesting to even see people who were on the other side, on her side, say, "Yeah, Kathy, you went a little too far." But I thought it was it was it's a bad joke. Yeah, but I, I've seen so many visual, visuals and images of, of Obama being hung. And nobody did anything. There was no outrage like that. Nobody was losing their job. The lady who was um, 
the you know running the tea party in 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 Southern California was the one who generated an image. There was some woman that was working in the tea party. Ted Nugent. Who yeah they were and they things. Never you know I think that it was really interesting, but I do think that it has a lot to do with Kathy Griffin being a woman. Like the condemnation of the woman this last year came you know to the point where it turned. Harvey Weinstein is no longer with us because, and I don't mean dead, so don't misquote me. I mean, he's no longer in the, in the Hollywood game because women are No, he so, was literally kicked out of the industry. Yeah, so tired. People, women just got so tired. I mean, the pouncing of Hillary, regardless of what your politics may be, I think that a lot to do with what was going on with Hillary was that she was a woman because I never ever hear, oh, he's not warm. I always hear, I always heard, I don't like that bitch. She's too cold. And I'm like... They'll say he's stupid. They'll say he's... But he was still president. Yes. <laughs> you know, and he still is president because they call Donald Trump Which stupid, stupid one? <laughs> they call Donald Trump stupid. They call George Bush, Bush Jr. Stupid. stupid. And they were both president. You know, mm -hmm. but her, the demonization of her, and I know a lot of it had to do, I just don't trust her. And then she started doing these videos, and yeah. one particular video that was around 17 or 20 minutes. Which one? The one with about or? Andy Cohen and, and her experiences oh, with him. Oh, Kathy, yeah. And I'm saying allegedly, because I don't know any of the truth. I don't know why she would do that if it wasn't her truth. Uh, I don't know what the reason for her doing that other than you know, unraveling or I don't really know. I don't have an answer for, I don't know uh, Andy and I, I do know Kathy and I've never seen her anything but gracious. Yeah. And even he, when I saw her recently at a political function, yes, she, she was nice. came always comes right over to me, always kind. Well, the other thing... Not to say that Andy Cohen isn't, I don't know him. I've never met him. I, Though I have called his number that I have and he never returns my call. That's, that's pretty funny. I have this number that he has that you can call, but he never returns it. I think that Caleb was reading that book. I just think with her, it was, it's just, uh, and you know, you've been in Hollywood longer than me. And the reason, one of the reasons why I stay away and to those people who are listening, who are not in Hollywood and don't work Hollywood jobs, sometimes it feels like high school. And oh, Martin Mull said it. It's high school with money. Yeah. It's like, you see the... You know, and now it's like, now we have the internet, so it's really, I mean, mm -hmm. I think the difference between Obama and, and Trump, it, it, certainly the black and white thing is a very big difference, but the bigger difference is the internet. Oh, yeah. And I wondered, I don't think that people would be so able to do things about Obama now as they did then. Yeah. I think there would be a change. And I only think about Kathy Griffin, imagine if that publicity stunt would have gone well. Imagine if it would have trended and everybody would have celebrated it. If she had control over it, as opposed to Donald putting it out, her putting it out, and it going the she other way. She didn't put it out. Ever. No, I know. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Imagine if, if there was a, a marketing campaign behind it, because it wasn't calculated by her. No, it was a... But imagine if it would have been, and it would have gone in, in her favor... Imagine how many people would have been like, oh, Kathy, we love you. You're fearless. Amazing. Well, uh, um, Rose McGowan, I watched part of it. I was on, a, a, uh, I think it was Good Morning America, one of the morning talk shows today talking. And I got to say, you know, she's really telling her truth. I may not agree with all, the way she's doing everything. She seems angry. But that's, but why? But people who've been raped are angry. Of course, and I think there's a reason to be. Yeah. I agree with that, but I think, wow, I have to give her props because she's saying, I'm going to be me. I'm and she's, and I don't see, you know, people offering her jobs. Well, that's what a lot of people have said that she's a disgruntled person because. Her career was over, so you know, she's nobody's like, career is over till it's till you're dead. Well, you that's know. the truth. She may be on a low, but it doesn't mean that we've all had lows. Maybe right. you haven't had it yet because you're. You, you I started at the low. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it goes up, goes down. That's the way it is, and I don't believe that when people say that because you never know what can happen. She's just at the when a woman gets towards forty, there's there's a transition po right. point in this business where that men don't have. Yeah, in no, the same but, but way. I. I I'm a believer of that because today I was on social media watching the looking at the pictures of the premiere of Black Panther, and Angela Bassett looks better than ever in at 60, and she was the best dressed on the red carpet. Her body is amazing. And yeah, but 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 I love all that. But why? 
why does it have to be always about looks? No, 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 no. But I'm not. Yeah, I, you know I'm what I'm saying? saying? Well, because women are always um, being objectified and always being reminded of their looks. She looks old. I think old. so. He I mean, looks, that's the next young. thing I think that to me is the next thing we're going to be doing in Hollywood. Is the because, ageism. Well, it's not just age. It's looksism. It's the idea that we're, you know, this whole... like. Amy Schumer had the most brilliant sketch on her show ever. Mm -hmm. She has some good ones. Yeah. And uh, it was called, it was with Julia Louis Dreyfus oh, turning yeah. 50 and about being fuckable. And that she was turning 50 and how all these women, you know, we were giving her a, a goodbye party because there goes your career when you turn 50. And then she goes off. They put her in a boat and she goes off, oh, right. you know. And I think it used to be, you know, stars would leave when they were in their late 30s, 40. You know, Irene Dunn, Deborah Carr, some of the biggest stars in Hollywood were over. Greta Garbo left the business before it happened to her. She didn't want to be that. She knew, you know, she couldn't see, you know, the ravage of her face. You know, all these women just sort of left the business. And I think women like uh, um, uh, Meryl Streep, I'd say Ellen Burstyn, Jenna Rollins, Cicely Tyson, Diane Carroll, all these women... Uh, sort of defied that. Susan Sarandon, Jessica Lange. Mm -hmm. I remember Jessica Lange in her 50s before uh, Ryan Murphy um, gave her all these great roles on American Horror Story. She said, I'm, I'm at the best age ever. She's awesome. You know? I mean, look at uh, Diane Lane. She became a sex symbol after 40. When she did Same with Susan Sarandon. She's, and yeah. Susan Sarandon and Renee Russo. Like, that mm -hmm. was, she was the lady in a Thomas Crown affair. But there is, you know, and, and what I was saying about Angela Bassett wasn't so much about her looks, but about her glow, that her mojo is there and mm -hmm. nobody's going to tell her that she doesn't have it. And when you look at her, you can see this thing coming from her that's pretty dope. And she's working. She's got a TV show. She's in a hit movie that just came out. And I remember hearing, oh, she's done. She's done because she said this about the writer Lee Daniels or because she said this and she said she's not done. She's like she looks like she's just getting started. So I do agree that there are. But she isn't somebody that wanted to work with within. And there's two ways to do that. She right. didn't want she turned down uh, the lead of what I heard in Monsters Ball that her, Halle Berry got. And I heard that. And, you know, that's a choice. That's a choice to do that if you don't want to play, you know, a downtrodden woman. Right. But it's, it, it, sometimes you can work within and, and kill it like Halle Berry did, or sometimes you can choose not to and to do other stuff. Now, I want to talk about Last Comic Standing. Sure. Well, this is a perfect time to talk about it. Somebody told me the other day, you should be talking about that now, especially right now. Why? Uh, because of what happened to me on the show. Because Tell me what happened. I don't know everything. You know, I have not watched a show in a while, so I want to hear your perspective. I don't well, know it as well. Um, so what happens was my grandmother and my um, my uncle died a few months before I did last comic standing. Which was so, three years ago? Uh-huh. Yeah. So my grandmother died of cancer, and my grandmother was my hero. So to watch my grandmother deteriorate before my very own eyes was rough. hard. And two months later, then my uncle, my gay uncle, was murdered in a hate crime. So it was August 13th, October 16th. And then I get a call for a Last Comic Standing, which because Last Comic Standing happened before the year was out, we just didn't know what was going, what was going to happen until after the year, the new year. So uh, when I when I finally got the call, because I went in and it was a couple of months went by, and I got a call and they said we they want you to come back and compete to go to the semifinals. Um, it was really hard to. I have went. I have gone through a very dark period. I know some people jump on stage right back. When so you went happened. in right into the semifinals. No, or I you had auditioned originally. I had auditioned originally, and then and you hadn't heard. I didn't hear. I thought I didn't get it because I never heard anything. So then a couple of months later, I get a call, and it's after um, you know all this stuff happens, and then I get the call, and I was like. Um, I'm not getting it. I felt like people could feel the darkness because I was still grieving the loss of my, my family members. So when I finally got the call to tape, um, I decided to pay tribute to my grandmother because my grandmother, her kitchen was full, full of sunflowers all the time. She had sunflowers everywhere. 
it was crazy. It wasn't like beautiful. It was kooky. It was like our refrigerator had like a hundred magnets of sunflowers. So the whole kitchen was like sunflowers and chickens, like porcelain knickknacks of chickens and roosters. And I was like, this lady is hilarious. But whatever those things symbolized to her, they were, they gave her joy. And I, my grandma had a very, very rough life. So I never really asked, but I know that <laughs> she loved these sunflowers and everything. And these like, chickens. And so for Easter, when I was little, she would always try to dress me in yellow dresses because she loved the color yellow. So I decided for last comic standing that I was going to wear a yellow dress to pay tribute to my grandmother. And you did. And I wore my uncle's pen, which you, if you look close in, it's a pen from his church when he was a deacon because my uncle was um, battling with his sexuality. So he would go back to the church and he became a deacon at his church and he was one of the most beloved person people at the church and my uncle's name is Raymond so when we hear everybody loves Raymond that was the truth because everybody loved my uncle Aww. his funeral was everybody from all over the place because they loved him so I decided to wear this yellow dress and I said I remember my grandmother was like don't you gotta look like a star you gotta look like a star so I go get my makeup done and I get my hair done at the dry bar like I go to the dry bar in Studio City and that's I when they blow your hair out <laughs> I paid forty dollars because I didn't have money, and I was like, "I'm gonna go get my hair blow dried," and um, and I went to Last Comic Standing, and you know I could feel the weirdness from the comics because in the hotel, well, there's a lot of pressure. I mean, it's like crazy. In uh, in the hotel we stay in, they stay and you go to the one floor, and then they have those staircase that the staircases that go like this. What do you call them? A uh, the spiral staircase. Sorry, staircase. So okay. I'm walking down the spiral staircase in this yellow dress with all this makeup done and these heels and all the comedians are already in the lobby. Because you don't usually me. dress like that. And But they're also looking like, who does this bitch think she is? You know, and then somebody whispers in my ear, this may not be a good idea. You know, you, you look like you're trying to be pretty and all this stuff. So I was like, I got my jokes. I got my set. I don't care what anybody says. I'm doing but it this. Wasn't a, it was a pretty dress, but it wasn't a sexually suggestive no, dress. No, it wasn't. No, I remember looking at it and saying, you just look great. And yeah, it was just a choice for me because I said, if I do television, my grandmother's old school. So my grandmother always says, that's the show. So if you're going to be on television, you need to look like a star. And you name these people Greta, Gar Gar uh, Greta Garbo. And, um, Deborah Carr. You know, and uh, what's her name? Greta. Hayesworth. Rita Hayesworth. Who, Rita Hayworth. Hayworth, who is Puerto Rican, of Puerto Rican descent, uh -huh. but she you know, lied about her heritage because of what was going on in Hollywood. I think her name is Margarita, which I think that's where she named, my mom's name is Margarita. So my grandmother was from that, you got to look like Sophia Loren. You can't just, so I remembered all of that. So when I get there, you know, I feel the weirdness. Some people were great. Some people were not. Some people were pretending to be cool, but they were talking behind my back and it was all good. When I get on stage and it's time to judge, um, Keenan Ivory Wayans takes a pause and Pat tosses it over to the other judges and Roseanne is like I love you why Roseanne Barr she says why don't you have your own show which they cut out but I have the video of it because I have evidence she was <laughs> like why don't you have your show already then um, uh, Russell is like oh Russell Peters Russell Peters is like oh I know Ida which I don't know why he did that because it didn't help me because he was like, I, she opened for me. And I was like, so did a lot of other people on here. We all did. Yeah. So it was really, uh, but he was just, I guess he was nervous too. He was on television and he's well, a his judge. first time being a judge. Yes. Yeah. And the first time the show, the, the first episode. So it's like, uh, everybody's feeling all these nerves. So they take, you know, they have earpieces, you know, they talk to them. Yeah. And tell them, and I have an interesting experience to tell about that, but they, they talk to them, so it's probably a little a crazy. Lot going on. Yeah, and so if you're then, not used to having an earpiece in your ear and having a producer talk to you while you're well, on the air, it's a little crazy. You can see that he was a little bit nervous, and he was nervous for me too. Oh, you know, that's like, sweet. I'm like his little sister. So then Keenan Ivory Wayans was like stumped, and he was like, Well, I gotta admit, you know, he's like, said something to the extent that he thought that I was attractive. Like, he was like, oh, look at her. She's beautiful. And then he tells me, proceeds to tell me that in comedy, your looks can be a distraction, so you have to tone it down. And he, he goes on to tell me this whole thing, which I don't think came from a bad place. Like, mm -hmm. I think he was Well, just, that was the rule. The era that he comes from. Yes. Mind you, he's got, he looks amazing. He has this great suit on, shirt opened up, you know. He looks like he's a bodybuilder. Yeah, he's telling, you know, looking at me and telling me, tone it down. Yeah, <laughs> so he looks like he belongs on the cover of a magazine. 
But um, I still, and I stand by that, I'm not going to persecute Keenan because I do think that Keenan was coming from the old school place of you girls got to be careful. Because Comedy you- rules. And until a cup round three years ago, it was the same rule. And all of a sudden now there's all these cute guys. There never was. Yeah. And now they're all taking our jobs. So there's no one doing so. That's so funny. <laughs> but yeah, he said... Um, I think um, you're, you know, you look great. I thought, I loved your set. He was like, and I think you're funny and you got jokes. So I like, you ain't got to rely on this because you got this. But do they talk about your comedy at all? Well, or are they still talk? He, well, obviously he was attracted to yeah, you. Yeah, well, it came to, it came across that way. And so there was a lot of backlash for that episode. And, you know, um, it was a moment that was a defining moment for me as a woman in comedy because I had to make a decision. Because now I made it to the next level and I had to decide now what am I going to wear. What did Roseanne say during all this? Roseanne was like malarkey. You know, like Roseanne is like, you, if you got it, then you use it. You use it. <laughs> uh-huh. If I had it, I would use it. You right. Know? She used everything about herself. Yeah. The housewife, people don't know. She had 15 minutes of, work, of housewife material and the rest of it was filthy, dirty material and women's rights stuff. Yeah. And when she did the Tonight Show, she used the stuff that was the housewife material. Well, it was, it was great. And she looked beautiful too. Like the other thing was that That was like, um, not the most beautiful that I had ever seen Roseanne, but definitely she really blossomed in her age. Like she, everybody was saying it. Like she looked amazing. Did she have the blonde hair then? Her hair, no, it's not blonde. It's silver. It was gray? Oh, now it's back to a a different color for the show. Yeah, but she looked beautiful. She was, Uh whoever was styling her, there was this confidence to her. I mean, one, one night she had on this white suit and she just looked amazing. So... You know, she was just like had her red lipstick on because she wore her red lipstick every week. And she was just looking at me like, you just focus on those jokes. Don't you worry about none of these guys. Anything that you're going through, I've gone through for you. So you just do what <laughs> right. I'm here to do. So then I had to choose again what I was going to do. And I did it. I came back with another dress. I had. I said, oh, I, good for you. I said, I'm going to wear dresses the whole last comic standing. I'm going to change my look every single time I come back. And I'm going to show that female comedians or anybody can be... Uh, can wear a dress and be yeah, funny. Yeah, it can be stylish. Or And it wasn't about the dress so much, but it was about... I miss that about old Hollywood where people would... Oh, God. You, Joan Rivers was totally... Yeah. She always looked great. And it's always reinventing your look, you know, because you're still, you know, you're still people. And I just wanted to tap into that and just say, I, I, this is this should be about my jokes. And, and when I came back in my other dress, I made it to the finals. And it was because my set was strong and the, the head writer was like, you are a TV show. You're a really good writer. And you... You're one of my favorite comedians on here, Jeff Stilson. And um and and I just stayed true to it. And then Ken and I had a really good conversation afterwards because he said, Look, I look at you and I think you're like the Puerto Rican Roseanne. He said, What I see in you is he's like, and I know stars when I see them. And he was like, I can see right through you and I can see you. And he was like, Don't ever let anybody take away from you what you have because what you have is that real shit that other people make up. And we were really we had a really good conversation and it was something that was like the first time anybody in Hollywood had ever validated me and I somebody famous right yeah, success, or somebody who success. Really, a man, the man who discovered Jamie Foxx and Jennifer Lopez and Jim Carrey and the list goes on you you're, you're talking about somebody who was in I was broken into pieces you know the two people who were my champions in life the only people who never abused me who only, always treated me well gone mm-hmm. within two months and I had these two kids that I was taking care of by myself who all, all they saw me do was lose to finally see me win something. My kids gave me a standing ovation. And it was it was what people didn't realize. Like, I got a lot of mean emails. Was that wasn't just a win for me. It was a win for my family, me and my kids. Because we had been homeless prior to last comic standing. And we had just gone through so much. My daughter was, you know, being bullied at school. So it was just... Because of the show? Or? No, she was just being bullied because girls Your were mean. Your beautiful daughter? Yeah, she was being bullied in middle school. So... It was it was just such a it was just a moment for all of us that I could see my kids crying in the audience when I looked out to them because they got to say that's my mom. You know? Oh, nice! And um, and it was just a big moment for us. So you know, I got this really mean email from um, a comedian who never gave his name, and he was like, you know, I read because I, I wrote a blog addressing what I had dealt with in comedy, and so I, you opened it up for. 
criticism. Yeah, and what he said was, I saw you, you're a subpar comedian. All you'll ever be is a bar club comic. Um, you made a comment about white male comedians. I'm a white male comedian, and I'm doing just what, just fine. Well, you're not a bar comedian. You're on Last Comic Standing. <laughs> exactly, and he, and he would just went on to tell me like how great he was doing, and you'll never be anything. And, and didn't sign his name. And didn't sign his name. And I always wonder who that was, but um, I have my suspicions. But it was really, you know, it was an experience for me because I had, I think it's like when women are comedians, and people hear us talk about sexism. They don't uh, get to peer into it because it's such a dark world and everything is done in secret. But that was something that was done. Well, it's a definitely a sexist. It's a boys club. Yeah. Well, it was on national television yeah. and I didn't have to say anything. But the, the show is, is produced by women. No, 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 no. Is, and you know, Wanda and Paige. Paige Horowitz and Wanda yeah. Sykes. And they, Wanda's a comedian. And both and, of those and, Paige. And both, you know, lesbians. So they're also women who... Uh, are LGBT, so they're also, and Wanda's a person of color, and, and uh, Paige is Jewish, and so there's certainly, it, it, the sensibility of the show has their sensibility, mm -hmm. and, and there's also guys producing the show, they too. They also had my back, and they had a very, no, they had a very female-driven production. Most of the, all of the field producers were, were women. Wow, and, that's um, unusual. And, you know, it was funny, because I, I was in the car with Paige, she was driving us to a location, and there was a guy on the production who was mansplaining to her and telling her what to do. And she just put him in his place. And it was just great to see because you, even her, she was like, wow, like I have the power to do that. Like, you know, she's I, also I, a wonderful comedian yeah. at the same time. too. So she, it was, they had my back the whole time. Like, even when I was dealing with, you know, some of the other comedians who were not very kind. I didn't realize that because we, we've never talked about this. We've been friends for three years and, I yeah. try to, I, you know, because like I, you know, you meet somebody and they're always holding on to shit that that's happened to them. And for me, last time standing was a blessing for me. Oh sure. So for me to go around highlighting the negative stuff that happened while I was on it, for me it doesn't feel right because uh, Wanda and Paige gave me an opportunity to go do what I do, and they were they didn't they didn't there was no special treatment. There was no it was. But I'm, we're going to give women an opportunity. They they had 27 people make it to the semifinals. And out of those 27 people, I think 17 were women. So what I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to disparage the show because it created a it changed your career. A stream it, of income for me and my family. And I, I, we haven't been homeless ever since. We haven't been. I haven't been, you know, to the point where I can't, I can't take care of myself and my family. Um, but it is, it was, you know, the sexism that lived, lived on Last Comic Standing was no different than what lives at a comedy club and what we feel. You'll still go to a comedy club and unless it's a comedian producing a show, we're talking yeah. about just by the comedy club itself, yeah. there is tons of shows that no women are on the bill. Oh, they always send me the flyers. I mean, well, we're on all the lists, yeah. yeah. And, there, and it's amazingly how many women are not on the... I mean, I, just as an openly gay... We, get, we keep a... a the, me and a group of comedians um, keep a log of all the flyers where... I did not know that. Yeah, because it, it's important to... But it's different if it's produced by... Because I find if it's produced by a comedian... You know, I, I was in Jay Davis's show. There were two Asian comedians in a row. I've never seen that in a comedian, a comedy club ever. Yeah, Jay puts a lot of diversity. Over. He doesn't care. He just puts on who he wants. Yeah, no, he's all, and he's always been like that because I used to do his room at the parlor. Uh -huh. um, but unfortunately, that's not the reality for a lot of other people in this. I was trying to find these flyers because I. You know, oh, I've seen them. But it's just I've seen them. Constant. Yeah, and it's still interesting, and I don't think people do it with oh, I'm not putting women. That's just that's what what's really weird is that there's there's such an unconsciousness to it. Yeah, it is. And even for an openly gay person, or now I'm a person of a certain age. If you're over forty, there's a different kind of attitude. You know, I thought oh, I got over being an LGBT person. Now I have to deal with being over forty, mm -hmm. and how you know being old school or not being the the person of the moment or you know even after being in a major film like birth of a nation it's uh it's interesting mm -hmm. you know the and it's i don't think people do it purposely it's just it's just the way they it's think. embedded in the thinking it's it's yeah a, you there's know. a certainly a straight boys club 
But the thing about women that you do, I will find that there's a lot more women opening for big acts than there is men because guys like to have pretty girls around. And they also don't feel like the women are a threat. So it's easier to have them open for them because they don't think we're funny. And I've heard someone who's oh, a big comic say They all say it. I not say all. It. I shouldn't yeah. say all, but a lot. A lot of them. I keep women because they're not going to bring it. And I have somebody cute on the show that I can look at. And if I get lucky, I'll get some ass. I've heard... Well, you've told me there are a couple of comedians that have actually said, hey, if you have sex with me, I'll bring you on the road with mm -hmm. me. Yeah. You know, and I would have done that. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you could have sex with one of them. Who I, I mean, I don't like any, any of them, but there's I'm one. I was, like, I was just thinking, you know how many times I've had sex with someone? I never got anything for it. I wish you could be with me like at every moment and you could just <laughs> pop up for me. I'd be like, I can't, but he can. <laughs> right. ah! And then they run for the hills. Oh, God. So next coming up, the new, two things coming up are really big really big stuff for you. One is a special on HBO and one is a special on uh, Showtime. Showtime. Tell me what the what the what each special is. So HBO is doing a, a new series called Entre Nos, which they Wow. Entre Nos. Which, which is means English between us. Which is Spanish. Yeah, but it they're in they are uh, highlighting the com comedians in the Latino community and and comedians with Latino experiences, because Eric Blake is on the one that I did. It's not, uh -huh. You don't have to be Latino to do it. But oh. they did a first series. Wait, wait, how come, why, are they, why are they putting people that are not Latino? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But okay. I know they did the first one, and it was Vlad Camaño, who had the, sh the deal at NBC, who did the pilot for NBC, who is now on Superstore. He is playing... America Ferreira's love interest. He just booked that. Oh, and I thought it was a white guy. Whatever happened to him on the show on, on that? They got rid of him? I don't know. I don't watch the show, oh, but I do know. I've watched this is new because I went to dinner with him. Oh, okay. So she broke up with him and obviously he's got a new boyfriend. Saturday, yeah. So now he's going to be on the show. And then um, it was Vlad, Shayla Rod uh, Rivera. Who was, oh, Shayla. I oh, my God. I love her. I did not know that. She she's a, working her ass off in Vegas for years. Oh, well, she's Puerto Rican, and I adore her, and she's one of my favorite people in comedy and has always been kind and generous to me. A so, sweetheart. That's yeah. lovely because I know she's really been – I mean, Vegas is not an easy place to work as a comedian because you have to sort of – I don't know how you grow there and do that because it's such a – it's Where are, are you talking about Shayma? Shayma? Oh, we're talking about Sh who are you talking about? Shayla Rivera. Oh, Shayla, not Shayma. Oh, I'm thinking. Yeah, never mind Shayla. everything I just said. It's the wrong. So Shayla Rivera is the Puerto Rican comedian. I'm mixing Rivera. her up with the Middle Eastern comedian. Yeah, with well, so, Shayma. So could, yeah, well, she's still great too. Yeah, she is. She is. But um, Shayla has been doing stand up for a long time. And Good for her. She was the Puerto Rican it girl many years oh, ago. Yeah. And, uh, had the deals and all that stuff, but she's a great comic. She's a, an engineer. She was an astronaut in Na at NASA and became no. a stand-up comedian. She's from Texas. God, her parents must want to kill themselves. I know. So she did the show, and then Frankie Quinones, which is also who got has a new TV show on TBS. So the and you did a pilot last year too. So yeah, so they did the show. Tell them the pilot you did. Um, the right. the thing with it was I don't know if I can talk about it because oh, it's okay. not dead. Well, it's a pilot presentation that you yeah. did a year ago. So, but it was with Cedric the Entertainer. Okay, I was going to say it that. It was um, a bunch of other comedians who were also really fun to work with, and um, yeah, so they they went and got this this platform and put three comedians on the show, not a whole bunch. And um, the first one aired and it did really really well, so they decided that they were going to do more. So that's when. Um, you were asked it. And, then, and I was asked to, I believe they said they wanted me to do the first one. But Can I we say the date it's airing yet? We don't have it. We don't have a date yet. And then what's the one at Showtime? Yeah. But that one comes out in February. We just don't have the date yet. So in February. Okay. And the one at Showtime? Yeah. That one airs in March. And that was a different thing because that was, um, I did the Shaq All-Star Comedy Jam, which is... A Shaq show. is the uh, basketball player? Yeah. He, this was a 13 <laughs> seasons he's been doing this with Showtime. Uh-huh. And um, this was the last one. This was the final one. Kevin Hart did it. And Kevin Hart attributes his his uh, success. success to the show because he said that was where everybody really saw him. He grew uh -huh. up after that show. But, you know, Bill Bellamy is on my show. I did it with Bill and um, Bruce Bruce. And 
Um, I used to tour the clubs with him. He'd always be coming in the clubs that I was going to work. And, oh, Bruce. Bruce. Oh, yeah. He was a real road warrior. The comedy clubs. Yeah, no, he's got yeah. a strong following on Facebook. Like, So the, we did that show, and I was the only woman. Mm. I was the only Latin person. Um, and I'm the only per Latin person to ever tape the Shaq All-Star. Gary Owen, I think, was the white, only white guy to ever do it. Um and it was just humbling because the only other women who've done that show are Gina Yashere, who's on The Daily Show, who I love, this British brilliant mm -hmm. mind. Monique is, she did the very first one. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. After she, she won the Oscar? Um, I don't know because she's been, she's been on, she's a Shaq All-Star. She's done, oh, okay. I did a show with her. After she did the Oscar, um, I did last. Com I did comics, uh, comics unleashed. unleashed with her right before she won the Oscar. Oh. Yeah, so that was sort of cool. Yeah, yeah, she was great when I did the show. She was her. lovely to me. Yeah, so she did the show, and so yeah, I think I am one of four women who ever taped it. So, so I would be remiss if I didn't talk about your cameo uh, in the film The Comedians with De Niro oh. that you were picked by Taylor Hackford to be in the film. They saw you at the cellar in New mm -hmm. York. Yeah. So that was sort of wonderful. It was. And you came to the, to the premiere with the screen, screening with Yeah. Uh, was that the premiere? They didn't have one. It, it, was, it was sort of like the big hot Tsitatsi cast and crew screening yeah. at CAA, which is a big agency. Yeah. it was. And De Niro, there's a picture of the two of us. Yeah. But De Niro looks like he's sort of, uh, what do you call it when uh, someone puts you in the picture? Um, Photobombing. He looked like he was, people say it was De Niro photobombing your picture. It looked like that. Yo, yeah. and, uh, we, I have two pictures with, with us. And uh, it, and he looked that way on like it just seemed like he didn't know which camera to look at. <laughs> but it was funny because he looked mad in the picture, but he was so lovely. Oh, he was lovely. Yes, he's yeah. a lovely guy, and that was really, really a highlight, I think, for you. Yeah, it was. It was also just to be. I didn't even know that night. Jeff Ross said to me, "It's a rough audience out there." Um, I might have to bump when they were taping the uh... before it before the night that oh when you were auditioning for the special they didn't see me so what had happened was that the, the club uh, the the comedians were not doing well from what I was told because I didn't see anybody set and then I was warned like the audience is not because the seller has pretty good audiences they, I think they so they pretty much rock with you so it's really weird to hear when the audience isn't like that and they, they were warning me and Jeff Ross was like be careful you know but I didn't know that uh, Taylor Hackford was in the audience and um, and then when I got there Taylor Hackford director of uh, uh, Officer uh, and a Gentleman White um, Nights. What's the movie with uh, Keanu Reeves, the devil movie? Um, uh, oh, yeah, with Al Pacino. Uh-huh. Yeah. And also Jamie Foxx. He, he oh, did Ray. Ray. Yes. But, you know... His wife is Helen Mirren. Helen, the, the dame. Dame Helen Mirren. And he was... Uh, you know, he was he was in the audience and I didn't know, so I had my set and I leave. And then a couple of weeks later, he calls me and I didn't know who he was. <laughs> and I was in Israel. And he was like, hi, Ada, this is Taylor Hackford. You were at a writer's conference. Yeah, he said, I saw you in uh, at the cellar and I thought you were great. I'm doing this little movie and I was wondering, you know, me and Bobby really liked you and I had no idea who was Bobby who? So I was like, listen, Taylor, I thank you so much. I appreciate you and Bobby. I'm in Israel and my phone is roaming. I said, I get back on this date. Do you think you can call me back on that date? Because, and then the day that I got back from Israel and I landed, I turned my phone on and he was calling me. No. And at that time, by that time I had researched. <laughs> I felt so stupid. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I'm so sorry. And he was like, it's okay. He said, I think I like it better that way. I like it that you didn't know who I was, but I want to know if you want to be in my movie. And I was like, oh, of course I want to be in your movie. Every movie you do from now on. <laughs> no, no, I haven't emailed him in a while. But, you know, he was so great to work with. Uh -huh. And just such a nice guy. And um, I get it. I get why the dame is into him. He's <laughs> pretty, pretty charming. So this has been incredibly great. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for doing my first show. Thank you for having me. I You're some of the shit I love. and <laughs> I like to be some of the shit you love. Uh, SIL with Jason Stewart. We're going to say goodnight to everybody or goodbye or good afternoon. And thank you so much for being on my show. People want to contact you. What do they do? My website is funnyiva.com and that's A-I-D as in David A dot com. Um, all my show dates are there. Um, and you can... 
reach me on social media at funny Ida, A I D A, and on Facebook, it's facebook.com Ida dot Rodriguez. But funny Ida is uh, your website, and they can get everything from that. Yeah. So just remember that. Yes. Funny Ida. Thank you all very much. If you need to contact me and you forget her name or forget anything, just go to jasonstewart.com, S-T-U-A-R-T. Thank you very much, everybody, and take care.